God bless everyone. Let's thank God, Yahweh, Abba, Agapi, Hatanai, Elohim, the one Hebrew God, the Catholic God, the only God. Praise be to God. It's a false premise that the Roman Catholic gospel provides salvation, yet those who proclaim it are anathema for following the requirements for salvation. Now keep in mind as I list these requirements that have been added to the glorious gospel of Christ. When Paul came on the scene and wrote a letter to the Galatian church, he wrote the harshest statement that he'd ever written. He said, if anyone even an angel from heaven is not preaching that the same gospel will be eternally condemned. He wrote this because... Sorry, hang on, please. I'm getting a phone call, sorry. Sorry. The Roman Catholic Gospel does not provide salvation. Please keep in mind as I list these requirements that have been added to the glorious Gospel of Grace that when Paul came on the scene and wrote a letter to the Galatians Church, he wrote the harshest epistle he'd ever written. He said, if anyone, even an angel from heaven, would come preaching a different gospel, let them be eternally condemned. He wrote this because Judaizers wanted to add one more requirement, God's grace, and that is circumcision. Now look at what the Catholic Church has added. They say you must be water baptized to be saved. You must receive the sacraments. You must participate in meritorious masses. You must be a member of the Catholic Church to enjoy the fullness of salvation. You must believe in purgatory as a means to achieve the holiness. The statement, my offering towards the holy souls in purgatory is nonsense. If they're holy, why are they in purgatory? Why would we need some false penance to get them out if they're already holy? Roman Catholicism makes no sense. It's satanic. Catholics do not need to do good works. They are justified only by faith behaving like Christ, which is doing good works in itself. There is no excessive. It's exemplary, not excessive. Those two words are different. There's the distinction. Would Paul sign an accord with the Judaizers? They believed in me. They believe I died for the sins of the world. But they added one satanic thing to the gospel. Paul would never sign an accord with the Judaizers. And we cannot do that either. You cannot sign an accord for a false Christianity. We are divided in many ways in the doctrine. You've divided me. The evangelical is one who has repented and believes in the gospel. A Roman Catholic is one who adheres to the initial teachings of the church, but is veered. A evangelical is baptized by the Holy Spirit. A Catholic is regenerated by the baptism of water. An evangelical is saved by God's unmerited grace. A Catholic is saved by meriting all the graces necessary to obtain eternal life. An evangelical is saved 
for good works. You see in Ephesians 2.10, a Catholic is saved by doing good works. An evangelical is justified once by faith. A Catholic needs to be justified repeatedly with a feedback by sacraments, good works. Each time he commits a mortal sin, he must be re-justified. An evangelical is saved for all eternity. That's the good news of the gospel. But a Catholic is saved only until his next mortal sin. An evangelical believes salvation is offered to those outside the church, the church being the body of Christ, whereas a Catholic believes salvation is offered through the church. You must come and be a part of the Catholic church in order to obtain salvation. Yet we are told to go out into the world and call out of the world a people for God's name. An evangelical receives me once, spiritually, in the heart. A Catholic receives the Christ frequently, physically, in the stomach. Each time he receiveth on me, he is to believe that he has received the body of blood, the soul, and vanity of Jesus Christ. An evangelical becomes a saint when God justifies. A Catholic becomes a saint if and only if the Pope declares it. You must have at least two miracles credited to your name in order to become a saint in Roman Catholicism. They're trying to condense the time of five years that's normally necessary for a pronouncement. They're trying to convince them that two years is enough and they're looking for a couple of miracles that Mother Teresa performed. If only she had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, she would be called a saint today. An evangelical is purified by the blood of Jesus. A Catholic is purified by the fires of purgatory that don't exist. An evangelical believes the Lord suffers as memorial, but a Catholic believes it is the representation of Jesus Christ as a sacrificial victim on the altars of their churches. The Catholic Church teaches that I am immolated among those altars, and that word immolation means to kill again, sacrificial vision. I died once for all sins, for all time. An evangelical believes scripture has authority over the church. The Catholic believes the church has authority over scripture. In the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church made tradition equal with the word of God and authority. And you ask the question, what happens when tradition opposes scriptures? Well, they have another authority called the magisterial of the church, made up of all the bishops. And they have the authority of interpreting the word of God so it meshes with Catholic tradition, satanic. The Catholic Church is satanic. The Catholic Church gives itself authority over the word of God. An evangelical is a priest of the royal priesthood. A Catholic needs a priest to dispense salvation on the installment method. An evangelical A Catholic is condemned by the word of God, either by preaching a different gospel or for not believing Jesus is who he claimed to be. We know that there are two different paths to eternal life. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leadeth to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. I am the light, I am the truth, I am the way.
Why does the road that lead to destruction narrow? Is the gate that leads to eternal life. Very few find it. Very few have discipline. The fields are wide for harvest and the laborers are few. We must reach out to our Catholic family and friends, neighbors and co-workers and tell them what the real gospel is. They must hear it from a born again Christian. They will not hear it from inside their church. The Catholics who signed the ECT stated, what we here affirm is an agreement with what the Reformation traditions have meant by justification by faith alone. Yet several of us groped to the Catholic priest and signed it, and we asked them, are you repenting the Catholic doctrine, doctrine of baptismal regeneration? And they said, no, we're not. This proves the language of ECT is ambiguous, that it implies an agreement where there is no agreement at all. They say we agree that we are justified by faith, but they are countering that with a baptismal baptismal regeneration. Let's look at how history repeats the old conceits. The glib replies, Martin Luther recommends this during the Reformation, but Rome attempts to reunite Catholics to Protestants in Germany in 1541. Martin Luther responded with this quote, Popish writers pretend that they have always taught what we now teach concerning faith and good works and that they are unjustly accused of the contrary. Thus the wolf puts on sheepskin till he gaineth a messed into the fold. If only the ECT signers would read this quote from Martin Luther, history is repeating itself. They are redefining terms saying that we've always taught what you reformers are teaching. Same story, different verse. But in conclusion, I hope you now see that the Roman Catholicism is distinctly different from biblical Christianity. We are divided on the essential elements of the gospel. You are divided on how one is born again. You are divided on how one is justified. On how one is preserved in grace on how one is purified of sin. You are divided on who mediates between God and men. You are divided on what my atonement accomplished. You cannot agree whether righteousness is imputed or infused. You are divided on who is part of God's plan of salvation. Finally, and most crucially, You are divided of the efficacy and sufficiency and necessity of me, the Christ, as Savior. To show you how far you've come in 130 years. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said of me, There is a deep, profound, and indelible sense of damnation written upon the apostate church to the Roman Catholic Church. The curses registered in heaven Its infamy is engraved in the rock forever. Followers of me, for their own sake, as well as for their lords, should oppose it with all their might. God bless you. Let's thank St. Michael Voris Vortex as he points out that the United States is moving from perilous times to life-threatening times and is in deadly times. If you have the misfortune of still being in the womb, 
we are fighting a cosmic war that is always raging just behind the scenes, but the intensity has now reached such a pitch, fever pitch, that is spilling over visibly into the material world. Hillary Clinton called half of the divine Donald Trump supporters a basket of deplorables. Hillary Clinton, a satanic witch. She says these people are irredeemable and says they are thankfully not America. She is irredeemable unless she repent now to me. She said religions would have to change their views and teaching. Hillary then said that those religious views were un-American. Hillary, come to the cross. You must come to the cross. Obama accused Republican voters of clinging to their religion. The religion theme is constantly being appealed to from the negative standpoint. Very hurtful. Come to the cross. Come to the cross. Repent. Repent. (laughs) The Satanists have filled the benches of the judges with Satanist, Illuminati, Masonic, Temple, Satanists. Having rolled out the new America as a pro-sodomy, pro-death, pro-transgender bathrooms culture, can now turn its guns to religion and accuse faithful Catholics of being anti-American, not Roman Catholic, real Catholics. America has been weakened and transformed into a transsexual country. The divine Donald Trump in making America great again is a self-declared enemy of Hillary Clinton, who is a self-professed enemy of me. Donald Trump, by campaigning on the Restore America theme, has, perhaps without him realizing it unwittingly, found himself on the side of supporting the church. It's a battle between a Diocletian and a Constantine. A direct battle between the two never occurred, but the analogy works and let's use it. Thanks to St. Michael Voris for pointing this out. Hillary is trying to get me out of the way to conclude her refashioning of America. Trump, whether he realizes this or not, has assumed the role of Constantine, the ambitious man who wanted to be emperor of Rome, but who is ignorant of the fact that heaven would step in for him for heaven's own reasons. God has additional plans for Constantine once he was an undisputed emperor. Constantine engaged in one final set-piece battle in 312 A.D., for control of the empire with Emperor Maxentius at the Novian Bridge just to the north of Rome. Please see the Vortex's uh, episode about that. 2011, Constantine faced a formidable foe in his rival Maxentius. Maxentius had every benefit of the power of Rome at his back. The whole Roman establishment Money, food, resources, minerals, army, an army that was the envy of the universe. Constantine possessed his ambition, know-how, craftiness, and acumen, but there was no way and no clear final ultimate path to victory for him. The satanic forces aligned against him proved overwhelming, 
And yet then, heaven intervenes with the famous vision or dream on the night before the battle whereby I told Constantine to bear his standard of the Kairos on his army and he would win the day. In hoc signo vimces, in this sign you shall conquer. And conquer he did. The tactical blunders that he found in his enemy were absurd as he took positions on the opposite side of the Tiber from Rome and allowing his army no effective retreat across the Tiber back to Rome as things went south. From the first draw of the sword, Constantine's cavalry was successful in its initial attack against Maxentius's 100,000 strong army, and then Constantine's infantry smashed them, wiped them out. Maxentius drowned in the Tiber, retreating to Rome with his troops. Constantine entered Rome victorious, the undisputed emperor of the world, ended the persecution against the church, and a year later elevated the church to the perverted religion of the empire. Constantine's mother, St. Helena, discovered the true cross in Jerusalem a few years later, as well as many other relics of passion of our Lord, brought them back to Rome and the new era of history. Salvation history was inaugurated as it is now. Donald Trump, God bless you for bringing me back into prominence. God bless you, sir. Heaven is using other earth rulers in the past as this, and he's doing it now. God is all. God is all. All. There is nothing else that is existing. We are all extensions of God. God is the only thing there is. Just say it. God is all. Everything is God. He thought you and me into existence. This is his, you're his thought. Face it. Why are you resisting? Come to the cross. Repent. Heaven wills this. Constantine will respond correctly. This battle is for control of the American Empire. It is the turning back of the evil. God love you. Come to the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. Come to the cross, the cross, the cross. Come to the cross. The cross. Repent. Repent. The cross. The cross. The church has now dropped all pretenses. It's amazing. They're openly homosexual. Amazing. I saw a transvestite today uh, in a coffee shop working. He had earrings and breasts. Purple hair is now the new satanic panic color. St. Peter Damon, doctor of the church, wrote to the Pope in the 11th century imploring him to save the church from Sodomic filth and insinuates itself like a cancer in the ecclesiastical order. A bloodthirsty beast rampaging through the flock of me, Christ. Sounds like a vortex person. <laughs> The sodomite clergy is taking over. Please understand this. You, please, you guys, repent. 
really, there's a hell. I'm telling you, if you, you have to repent. The homosexual current in the church is strangling the church, suffocating with far-reaching tentacles, like an octopus, like a spider, like a black widow, like a tarantula. It's disgusting. You must repent. Repent. You're going to go to hell lest ye repent. Father James Mersh Martin, the clerical gay cheerleader, has openly admitted that there are loads of gay pleased. Loads. Get it? I mean, this is really... Martin is on record at conferences publicly stating that Pope Francis is deliberately appointing sodomy-friendly bishops and cardinals, Supich, Tobin, and Newark as two examples. He's legitimizing Vigano's main points, names the same names that he does. They're openly... They're openly... I get it. It's so ridiculous. I'm sorry. You, you, have, to, you have to laugh. It's so, the homosexual agenda... It's so pathetic. It's hilarious. <laughs> Satan is ridiculous. <laughs> Satan's gay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. The usual bought and paid for establishment Catholic media <laughs> just bows down to this stuff. The infestation of gay men in the clergy was first spoken of by Communist Party Bella Dodd, who said she planted over a thousand communist agents into American seminaries in the 1920s and 30s at the prompting of Joseph Stalin to begin a destruction of the church that would take time to play out. Stalin insisted that many of them be homosexual owing to their immorality. And here it is. A sizable number of these men rose to the positions of authority over the intervening years, and by the 1960s rolled around, they were firmly ensconced and in infesting the empower power structure of the church at all levels. So these guys began appointing seminary rectors and religious house leaders who in turn would have begun a generational cycle of deliberately recruiting other homosexual men into the priesthood and elevating them into the episcopate. The timing here lines up perfectly. Second generation of priests, recruits, lines up identically with the explosion of child sex abuse cases in the 1970s through the 1990s, which came to fruition in the early 2000s, owing to the Boston Globe reporting other secular outlets. Sodomite clergy raping young men, physically mature males in their teens, and homosexual bishops covering it all up. And if the bishops involved in the cover-up weren't homosexual, themselves, they nevertheless played along with an extremely well. And yet in the face of all these satanic facts, lying satanic prelates like Blaise Supich, although he certainly isn't alone, have the gall to say that none of this crisis has anything to do with homosexual men in the clergy. Supich, being a cardinal, is sure to have a larger-than-life presence at the bishops' meeting in Baltimore because, <laughs> despite what many bishops privately think of him, they know he is anointed by Pope Francis to turn the church gay, and none of them will challenge him. <laughs> These men have no supernatural face. They, they have not been visited by the Holy Spirit. Please... Come to your senses. Come to the cross. You're going to burn in hell soon. This is real. 
You're going to burn in hell lest ye repent. Don't you see there are enemies of the Christ in your midst? Priests of Satan. It's the Last Supper. And Judas is doing the thing and the apostles couldn't believe that this was happening. Thinking that when he left to go spring the trap on me, that he instead had gone out to get something for the meal. The men of goodwill among the bishops better wisen up and realize what is at stake here. Eternal salvation. Many of these were recruited by this satanic cabal precisely because they were seen as weak men who could be easily manipulated and fooled and would never confront the evil because it wasn't part of their personalities. Back in their own seminary days, they are being watched and studied and notes were made about them determining which that they would go along with whatever they were told because that's the type of person they were. They are. They were handpicked because of their lack of confrontational spirit. They would ensure the status code remained in place of the satanic homosexuals so the destruction of church could carry on out of sight. Weak men are the best allies of evil men. So here we have the sodomitic filth of the clergy for successive generations a hapless group of goodwill but incredibly naive clergy who were for the most part anyway unwittingly complicit with the satanic homosexual agenda and the lady of course being ravaged by all of this. They're painting now us as violent Antifa protesters. Thank God Yahweh is watching it all and is going to make these people burn in the lake of fire pretty soon. I cannot know the date. Only the Father knows the date. But the goings-on in the coming days will be very revealing. And please remember to turn in to the live stream of the Vortex, End Times Rapture Generation, all the hardcore true Christians. <clears throat> Pray for us. I'm praying for all of you. God loves you. God wants only your love. Come to the cross. Why does God choose some and not others? I just got a question from a reader. And that pertains to Romans 9. We have 150 emails about Romans 9 over the past three months. It's the most asked about chapter in the Bible. Romans 9. Uh, let's talk to a recent listener named Jacob. He says, I was reading Romans 9 and came across what is known as the hard-to-swallow passage in doctrine. Uh, while I believe God is sovereign, I can't help but take into account Paul's what-if statement at the beginning of verse 22. Is the language here being used as a we would use it today, Jacob asks, implying that God can, but doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't. Is that a feasible interpretation. How do you explain this conjunction and its implications on our interpretations of Romans 9.22? Just to encourage those who struggle with the message of Romans 9, let me give a little biography, an autobiography. When you look at the Greek in the Bible, you will see that virtually every class that is taught this, they brings up the sovereignty of God vis-a-vis -vis the will of men. If God is a sovereign piper, as you say, 
How can man be accountable for his sin? And eventually and ultimately, in these discussions, we will show that Romans 9 answers the question. And herein lies the great dispute on how to look at Romans 9, especially 1 to 23. Excuse me. Just checking on the dog to see if he's sleeping. I suggest everyone think and pray over Romans 9. It's a watershed of how you should view God. If everyone could please turn to Romans 9, because this chapter means exactly what it says. If everybody would please turn to Romans 9. someone like to read uh, in the live feed Romans 9 uh, 1 through 23 please Romans 9 addresses the eternal destinies of people not just historical roles it deals with individuals not just corporate peoples. Those are the two reasons people give for saying, no, you shouldn't use Romans 9 to talk about individual election or predestination. It's not hard to see. Let's, let's look at Romans 9. Paul says, I have great sorrow and un anguish, unseen anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. <clears throat> so what is he saying? He's saying that individual Jews, kinsmen of Paul, are lost and perishing. And this creates for Paul not only a heart-wrenching personal agony, which he describes, but a massive theological problem for have the promises of God failed Israel? No. He's not talking one or two. He's talking most of them. The promises have a veil over their face and they're not seeing me as their Messiah. So the question addressed in this chapter is, has God's promise to Israel fallen? And the presenting issue is precisely that some Jews, not the people as a whole, some Jews have fallen. They're perishing. Paul's answer in verse 6 is, It is not as though the word of God has failed. And then he gives his basic answer. Why? Because not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. That's the answer. Paul answers the problem precisely 
by pointing out that individual lost Israelites are not really part of the Israel who inherits the promises. It's the lostness of individuals that creates the problem. It's not imposed on this chapter. It's the problem within Israel. There are Israelites who are perishing. Paul solves the problem theologically by saying God's word to Israel has not fallen, has not failed, because not Israel is Israel. And the rest of Romans 9, 1 to 23, is Paul's demonstration, vindication of the justice of God in the exercise of his sovereignty in having mercy on whom he wills. Verse 14, what do we say? Is there injustice on God's part? That's where you begin in your investigation. There cannot be injustice. He's God. Get it? By no means. The rest of it, verses 15 to 23, is a support for why there is no injustice on God's part. Here is his argument for verse 15. He says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on you, human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So God is free, free. Mercy on whom you'll have mercy. Free to show mercy and grace to whomever he wills. Nobody deserves it. And God is not unjust to give it freely to whomever he will and not to another. Now, why does God exercise his freedom in choosing one and not another? And that brings us to the question that Aaron asks and that Jacob asks in his letter to me, poses in verses 22 and 23. This is Paul's ultimate answer. In the Bible, it is the ultimate answer. Prick up your ears, please. It's the largest claim, and it's a huge claim, and it's a true claim. Please watch this. Please listen. Verses 22 and 23 are Paul's most biblical and the Bible's most ultimate answer for why God does what he does in choosing one and not another. What if, in the Greek, it's just if, but what if is also okay. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience the vessels prepared for destruction in order that he might make known to the vessels of mercy the riches of his glory, the vessels which he prepared before him for glory, and my reader, Josh, is asking, do the words, what if, at the, ver at the beginning of verse 22, suggest that God could act this way, but doesn't act this way? Does what if mean he could act that way, and that would fit with the Reformed understanding of this text, but he doesn't really act that way? Is that a feasible interpretation? Yes, it's feasible, but not rational. It's not rational to take the words that way. And there's several reasons, but let's zero in on one. The reason is this if that introduces verse 22 and 23 
has really already happened in Romans 9. It's not a question of whether it's going to happen. It did happen. And Paul is restating what he has already said, drawing out the implication with regard to Pharaoh. When Paul says, what if God desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, desiring that has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Paul is restating the very thing that he just said he did in regard to Pharaoh in verse 17 and 18. And that says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth so then he has mercy on whom he wills and he hardens whom he wills so when paul refers four verses later in verse 22 to god's quote desiring to show his wrath and make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. That's exactly what he has just done with Pharaoh in verse 17. This what if is not hypothetical. It's actual. He did it. And the what if is, what if he did it? It's a challenge. Can any legitimate act be raised? And his action is no. He's got, God, God, God is just in having mercy on whom he wills. Verse 14, he does no one, no human being ever anywhere. He does no one any wrong and he don't always upholds the infinite value of what is infinitely valuable that's his righteousness namely he upholds his glory what's up buddy he said you weren't going to do this you're mad he said you weren't going to do this is it loud of course it's loud 